Howard, good to see you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, some new names we can look forward to seeing on the, on the Premier League roster over the festive period. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, uh, excited to see the appointment of Rebecca Welsh to her first Premier League uh, referee's appointment. She's worked as a, a fourth official on the Premier League previously, but she's going to take charge of a game uh, on the 23rd at Fulham. And then on the 26th on Boxing Day at Sheffield United, we'll see Sam Allison taking charge of his first game. They're both part of the PGM World Development Group. It's uh, an initiative that's tied into the Elite Referee Development uh, Plan, which has uh, been in place for a couple of years now. Ideally, kind of fast-tracking talented officials through the pathway. We've already seen three officials from that group take charge of their first Premier League games in, in recent weeks and months. Uh, and now we have number four and five. And uh, it's uh, showing that the value of that work that's happening in that space uh, is, is really evident. But more than that, we have our, then our first woman uh, in charge of a Premier League game and our first, I think, black referee since Uriah Rennie. What's the significance of that, would you say? Yeah, um, you're right. Um, we've not seen a, a female take charge of a Premier League game ever before, so it is significant. And then Sam being the first black official with a whistle since Uriah Rennie, an ex-colleague of mine. Um, and again, down to the quality of his performances in recent weeks in the, in the Football League, in the Championship, and both appointments are really well deserved. Um, but of course, it also shows... Uh, them as role models as well um, because it demonstrates that people can make it through the pathway they're both from you know, groups that are not traditionally well represented within the Premier League officiating uh, uh, cohort and uh, and hopefully it might inspire other people to give it a go and think refereeing might be for them as well I've heard Sam uh, in particular talking before about the, the value of being a, a black man and a role model for his community as a referee, but he's also an ex-footballer. We don't have too many of those with a whistle in their hand. Do you think that's also significant? Yeah, uh, he played at a decent level. He played in the, in the, uh, the semi-professional game and I think maybe played just in the professional game for a period as, as well. So uh, clearly that, um, that's given him um, an insight into the game, which is a little bit different than if you haven't played. And it also speaks to some of the work that we're trying to do to entice more players into, into refereeing. I said some months ago when I first came into this role that I'd love to see more ex-players take up officiating. And we're working pretty closely at the moment with the PFA to try to formulate a real plan, something really tangible that we think will be appealing to players coming towards the end of their playing career or maybe players who you know, have suffered an injury or been released at a younger age but have got that lived experience of being around the game as players that might just prepare them in a really, um, a really uh, nice way to take up the, uh, the whistle. So hopefully some more news in the coming weeks about what that looks like but we're really determined to make this happen. We really want to entice players into the game and, and again, and Sam is probably an example of how that can work. Let's hope it goes well. Um, also, you, you've got an update on the participant behaviour charter. Tell us more about that. Yeah, we, uh, we came into this season with a responsibility to try to change the way that the game looked from an officiating point of view. We'd seen year on year a decline in, in, uh, in certain aspects of the way that participants were behaving, the increase in the times that officials were surrounded, confrontations, technical area issues. And, and I think that's not unique to the English game. We'd seen it all over the world. I, I speak to heads of refereeing from many of the top European countries and they were all seeing a very similar thing. We saw a really uh, disgraceful scene, didn't we, in Turkey only a few days ago with the referee being assaulted on the field at the end of the game. Um, thankfully, we'd not seen anything like that here, but we'd seen a decline in behaviours all the same. And, uh, and I think a recognition uh, was... was uh, uh, was made that something had to be done and the stakeholders came together and created a working group to look at this and out of that came the participant behaviour charter really to empower officials to take firm action supported by all of the game to try to change that direction of travel and our officials were tasked at the start of the season with being robust and consistent in their in their uh, dealings with behaviours that fall below an acceptable level and they've absolutely delivered. I mean, the numbers that we saw come out this week show that you know, the cautions for dissent have almost doubled. Technical area yellow cards uh, have increased as well. But alongside that has been a reduction in the times that people surround officials. The numbers of mass conversations has reduced. So 
we think it's had a positive effect in that respect. Of course, at some point, we want to see the descent, yellow cards, and decline. We're here to change that particular part of the game, the culture of the game in relation to, to Does that suggest that the message is not quite getting through if there's such an increase in, in bookings for dissent? Um, I think it will take a bit of time. We're talking about changing something that's been embedded for quite some time, this, this sort of like automatic challenging of officials' decisions, um, whether they're right or wrong, whether you agree with it or not. And it does take a bit of time, but I'm confident that you know, it will change. We're not going to back down. We said that at the start of the season. This is not just a campaign for this season or next season. It's here for good, for the good of the game. And, and therefore, we keep reminding our officials of the importance of, of being robust in this, in this aspect. Not trying to take out emotions from the game, not expecting players to agree with every decision, understanding there'll be a reaction in the moment, but also, you know, ensuring that they know they will be supported when they take strong action against those behaviours that are more than just that, when the behaviour goes beyond just that immediate reaction, when it's dissentful, when it's something that's really clear and obvious, that undermines the official's authority and does nothing for the, you know, for the image of the game. And of course we haven't seen a, an entire eradication of, of players surrounding officials. We had one very high profile incident at the end of the, the Manchester City Tottenham game when, when Simon Hooper blew up for a foul when a lot of people would have liked to have seen him play the advantage for Manchester City. What was your reading of that situation? Yeah, I was, I was disappointed for Simon because uh, he'd refereed the game really well for, what, 93 minutes and another great Premier League game. We've seen so many this, this season. This one's 3-3 going into, uh, into added time and, uh, and he's done well. And there's no talking points from an officiating point of view. That's, that's where we want to be. And, uh, and of course, he knows when he doesn't play advantage and it becomes apparent that a really good advantage is on, that that's going to be the talking point. And uh, he, um, he just made that decision to blow just that tad bit early when he's waited to see, doesn't think it's quite on. By the time he's formulated the decision to blow what's quite a strong foul challenge in midfield with the ball initially coming backwards, he blows the whistle, but as he's doing that, the ball's going forward and, and of course then it becomes clear and, and at ground level it's not quite so easy to see the way that things are going to develop and, and what have you. That created a reaction from the, the players, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about, you'd expect a reaction but it needs to be, you know, in the moment, it needs to then be controlled, you know, in a professional way and I know that, uh, that Simon cautioned uh, Erling Haaland for his reaction in that moment. Manchester City, the only team to have been charged for surrounding this year, arising out of that situation, which I think demonstrates the success that we've had in this area. You, you also um, then spoke on your programme about the error that Simon had made. How do your officials feel when you do that, when you, when you come out and publicly tell everybody else that they've made a, they've made a big mistake? Yeah, I'm sure they don't really like it, but uh, it's not the purpose of the exercise. It's not meant to focus on, on errors. It's the, the, the reason we're we're doing shows like Match Officials Mic'd Up is to draw that curtain back on some of the processes that go into the decision making that people see but maybe don't fully understand and we, we thought collectively there was a real value in, in doing that, in being able to show the officials in a, a positive light most of the time because they're making good decisions repeatedly. And of course, if all we ever showed was when it works well, then we'd be accused of obviously not showing the full picture because on occasions we do make errors and we, we therefore we have to show them and we have to show how and why they occurred. But alongside those few occasions are many examples of when it works really well, when when VAR, and it's not just about VAR, by the way, but, but obviously a lot of focus is, is on VAR. It demonstrates when they positively contribute to, to the game. So, you know, we, we do this with the, the general blessing of the officials. They understand that the modern game, you know, requires more information being shared. And, uh, and hopefully by doing that, people will understand and accept the decision-making rationale at least, even if you don't agree with the final outcome. In a world that, you know, in a game that creates lots and lots of subjectivity and therefore you're not always gonna agree with the final decision, but at least understand it and we're, we're trying to get to that place. There's of course a lot of discourse, Howard, about referees. Um, everyone wants to talk about things they do wrong most of the time rather than things they, they do right. Um, do you think there's a, a direct correlation between the incident that we saw in Turkey that you've already referenced and behaviour of players, managers uh, in high profile games? I think it's indicative of the decline that we talked about a few moments ago that we've seen over, ye let's be honest, years really, haven't we? You know, we've seen a, a, a decline in in standards of behaviour, reactions towards officials, um, that's impacted 
officials at grassroots levels as well. You know, we know that um, far too often officials starting out in their officiating journey face a really challenging environment and some quit, some don't go beyond those first few weeks and months because of what they experience. We've not previously seen something like that at the very highest levels of the game and it's, you know, it's quite scary to see it happen in the way that it did in, uh, in Turkey. And I think it just reinforces the need for some of the work that's been done collectively by all of the game. And I've got to give credit to players in the English game. This season we have seen a reduction in surrounding. We've seen a reduction in those kind of really clear actions of collective dissent against officials. Yes, dissent cautions have gone up, um, but we've also seen a positive in terms of you know, the acceptance of decisions. And, and, and the reason why dissent cautions have gone, gone up is because referees have been more robust in dealing with those behaviours, which has in turn led to that reduction in surrounding. Whereas previously they might have been turning a blind eye. We had to do that for our grassroots colleagues to show that there's an example being set. I was on a train the other day going back home, back up to Yorkshire, and you know a, a, a guy sat opposite me, leaned over and said, thank you. And I don't often get thanks, so I, I took it. But... I said, what for? He said, because I'm, I'm a, a father of a 15-year-old, I coach and referee his team, and this year's been different because the example that we're seeing on the Premier League of players being dealt with when their behaviour drops below a certain level by the issuing of yellow or red cards is different in turn. We're not seeing referees being surrounded. So that's the kind of effect that we collectively as a game wanted. But do you think the incident in Turkey could happen here? I really, I really hope not. Um, I, you can never say never, but I, I really would be you know, surprised if it did, but you never know. I imagine the people in Turkey didn't expect to see something quite, quite like that. We've just got to collectively as a game continue doing the right things and, uh, and working with our, our colleagues in, you know, in the PFA, the LMA, in the leagues, the FA, to continue presenting that really strong, uh, powerful example of what's, what's good about the game. Pierre Ligi uh, Colina, the, the head of... Uh, referees with FIFA has, has called it a, a cancer on our game and, and a cancer which could kill football. Would you go as far as that? Yeah, I saw those comments by Pierre Luigi. Um, of course, we, we need officials in the game. The players are the ones that need to be celebrated for, for what they do to create that amazing sport that we all fell in love with as kids and, and still have a love affair with. The referees and all participants need to be valued and respected. And... Um, Without them, there is no game. If we don't entice people into this part of the game, we've spoke about, we've spoke about players coming into the game, trying to open up the door to, 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 to that group, trying to open up the door to people from traditionally underrepresented groups. Rebecca and Sam going out over the Christmas period as great examples of what can be achieved. Um, and if people don't believe it's something that they're going to enjoy because of the environment or they see something like what we saw happen in the Turkish league then they might not take up the whistle the numbers go down the quality goes down the abuse increases more people quit the numbers go down the quality goes down it's a vicious circle that we have to break and we think we've done well this season in collect collectively in breaking some of that cycle but there's a lot of work still to be done Let's move it away from the, the, the picture itself the language um, around social media sometimes around Broadcasters can be quite extreme when talking about referees and refereeing standards. Do you think we in the media have a responsibility here as well? Yeah, I think, I think we all do. I think that uh, you sort of like set some of the narrative as, as broadcasters. You do a great job in presenting this fabulous spectacle. We talked earlier about the game at Man City and, and Tottenham and we have been blessed by some great games and, and the media is so, so crucial in telling that story and presenting all that's good about the game and of course if officials make errors and I don't you know I don't want to focus about errors but I have to accept that they do happen and if they do then we hold our hands up that's something that I've been determined to do this season when the need arises so that we can you know avoid benchmarking against errors if we see something that's clearly wrong I'll reach out to the club and tell them you know that was an error don't expect to see that the following the following week um, rather than leaving them thinking is that something that we think is okay I think that's important and if that's commented upon by the media in the coverage that's fine of course everybody is entitled to an opinion and sometimes that opinion will reference something that we've not called correctly and and uh, will work harder to improve the next the next time so it's not about being thin-skinned or never wanting focus on uh, the officiating point of view we 
we work in a sport that's low scoring, that turns on moments, and those moments often involve officiating. And of course, therefore, naturally, you're going to cover some of those moments. You have to, they're big moments in the game. But I hope that some of the work that we're doing to engage with the, the media, the broadcasters, behind the scenes and more publicly, can assist in everybody's greater understanding of what goes into the decision-making process. Um, an understanding into the laws of the game, for example, so that when that judgment, that opinion is formed, at least it's an informed one. Uh, I think that's quite important. I, I know you didn't come into this job for praise. In, f in fact, when I um, knew I was coming here today, I, I just typed in Howard Webb into the search engine. And I never do that. The first word that popped up was, was criticised. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Webb criticised. Um, there are those that would say it's deserved criticism because standards are slipping. This, this has been said, Howard, not just by um, ex-players, it's being said by some leading Premier League football clubs and it's also being said recently by ex-referees. What's your take on that, that the general standards of refereeing are slipping? I, I don't agree with, with that. Most weeks, most of our group deliver uh, in a really positive way to, to the game. We have some talented officials coming through the, uh, the pathway. We've mentioned a couple who are going to be working in the Premier League for the first time with the whistle over Christmas, but we've already seen others come in to the Premier League as well and all the way through the, the leagues that we serve in the men's and, and the women's game. Um, obviously, it takes a bit of time to, to bring people through, benefiting from the additional support that we're putting in place. There's quite a few initiatives happening right now to facilitate that, that development. In recent years, last two or three years, we've lost some pretty experienced referees as well and they take a, a bit of a, a replacing, of course, when, you, when people re eventually retire and then we have to bring the next generation through. In a game that's you know, more unforgiving than ever, I think, more scrutiny than, than ever before, we've seen some of the changes take effect that we've been talking about today around participant behaviour. That's meant that officials have had to take a stronger approach and I think that's for the good of the game. Maybe not everybody would always see it that way in the moment, but we feel it's absolutely the right thing to do. So we're confident about the future and the direction that we're taking. Some things will take a bit of time to, to become really visible, if you like, as we develop these officials through the extra investment that's coming in. Uh, and we're grateful for that investment in the Elite Referee Development Plan. And um, I genuinely believe the future's bright. And of course, a lot of the conversation still surrounds VAR which has been a hot topic for, for a lot of people for, well, since the, the date was brought in. You've, you'd have heard some pretty high profile people saying in recent weeks that they're ready to wash their hands of it. Let's get rid of VAR and, and start again. What would be your message as we come to the end of 2023, your, your New Year message <laughs> about the future of VAR in our game? Well, I maintain the view quite strongly that VAR makes the game fairer and it makes our officials more accurate. We see that repeatedly um, time and time again. It would be kind of folly, I think, to remove VAR from the game and allow those clear errors to stay within the game. We've already seen almost 40 clear errors correctly rectified this season in the Premier League. By the end of each season, we normally get to around 100 of those situations. Um, yes, we've seen some high-profile errors this season, of course, I'm not sitting here saying it's perfect. We've learned from each of those. When we reveal the audio each month that demonstrates the work of our officials, I hope that people do recognise the, the professionalism, the clarity that's, that's evolving in that communication and within our decision-making process. We're always trying to be better each and every time. We'll see that improvement continue as we embrace even better technology as the officials become even more skilled, as we focus on the group of officials that can deliver this repeatedly, um, week in and, and, and week out. And therefore, you know, I, I strongly believe that this is good for the game. We're trying to be efficient without sacrificing accuracy. We know that long delays can cause frustration, albeit there are occasions when that's unavoidable if you're doing a diligent job. But I listen. We're not living in a, in a little vacuum, if you like. I'm a football fan at heart. I want the game to be fair and accurate, but I also want to maintain all of what makes the game great, the tempo, the emotion the game creates. And we'll continue working to our utmost to continue positively contributing to the game, reducing the errors, understanding that not everybody will always agree with our outcomes. The subjectivity always going to be at the heart of some of our 
our judgments um, and trying to be as efficient as we can be so that you know each and every season the contribution that VAR makes as a safety net sitting in the background is more and more positive but never forget good officiating starts on the field it's about developing good officials who can manage the game manage the event make good decisions on the field and the long-term aim I suppose is to push VAR into the background to only intervene when it's really needed on those clear and obvious errors. Thanks, Howard. Wish you well. Thanks, Dave.